Right, hello and good evening everybody. My name's Tracy and I'm one of the nutrition team from Denji Horse Feeds. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar on keeping hens, everything you need to know. I'm joined this evening by Alison Leggett from the British Hen Welfare Trust and Sarah B from the Allen and Page Smallholder range. And this evening we're going to give a series of presentations that will hopefully give you a little bit more information on keeping your hens. So the plan for this evening is after I've done some introductions, Alison is going to present first, um, followed by Sarah and then followed by myself. And at the end of the session, we're gonna have a QA and a session where hopefully we can answer some of your questions that you've already sent in ahead of the presentation. Um, or alternatively, alternatively, if you'd like to ask any further questions, please do. You'll see on your screens um, that there's a little Q&A box. If you'd like to put any questions in the Q&A box that you'd like to ask, then if we don't manage to get to them by the end of this session, then hopefully we can email you back with some answers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alison um, Leggett from the British Hen Welfare Trust. Whilst Alison takes her, her mute off and puts her camera on and shares her presentation, I will just introduce her a little bit more. So Alison has always had a passion for animals and amazingly she's been able to make a solid career out of it. In 2019, after 20 years of working a land-based college in the Animal Management Centre, growing both the programme and the facility's physical footprint, Alison found her way to the British Hem Welfare Trust by volunteering for them. Noticing her outstanding talent and caring nature, they asked her to join them at Hen Central as their welfare centre officer. Alison can also be found pitching in on rehoming days, answering phones and organising volunteers, hens and adopters alike, which I'm sure is no mean feat, Alison. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you to get you to share your presentation and I'll leave you um, in charge. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, lovely. OK, so we're there. OK, thank you, Tracy. So just bear with me. So just a little bit about the, the, um, the Welfare Trust just to start with. So we do, um, uh, so we rehome the commercial laying hens, we place them in caring homes. So basically what we're doing is we're rebranding farm livestock and just making them into um, pets. We raise hair, um, hen welfare awareness by educating consumers about how the choices they make in the supermarket, how that impacts on the hen welfare. And we also collaborate with government, so DEFRA and AFA, and the veterinary institutions to develop programmes to improve welfare for commercial and domestic hens as well. We also encourage support for the British egg, egg industry. So we're really proud to say that we are staunch supporters of the British egg industry. And the welfare in the UK is amongst the highest in the world. And our great British farmers are willing to listen to consumer concerns on welfare. So just showing that, um, you know, they, uh, um, uh, the, the farmers, sorry, I've just lost my um, thing there, apologies. So um, how we got here. So we were founded in 2005 by Jane, Jane Howarth, um, after she watched a Panama, um, Panorama documentary about factory farming. So originally called the West of England Retirement Home for Battery Hens. Um, this year or that year, it was given charity status and the, the name changed to the Battery Hen Welfare Trust. But in time, it changed again to what we are now. So the British Hen Welfare Trust. So the following year, Jane rehomed four hen, 400 hens. She actually started the charity from her kitchen table, which is quite interesting. Um, in 2016, Jane was awarded an MBE for her work, so improving the hen welfare, which went some way towards the 2012 banning of battery cages. So it was really fantastic that this work was recognised as an important aspect of animal welfare. And to date, we've rehomed over... 809,000 um, ex-commercial hens. So we believe that all hens should enjoy natural freedoms. Um, so freedom to range on the pasture, to enjoy the sunshine, the fresh air, 
um, to have a good old scratch around for insects and to actually lay an egg in a nest as well. So the goal is for consumers and food manufacturers alike to buy only UK produced free range eggs, um, which will ultimately result in that strong British egg industry and it will in time improve the lives of all the commercial laying eggs, sorry, the laying hens. So our whole ethos is based on positive campaigning and as a result of our pioneering work, an increasing number of consumers now want health, high welfare as well as high quality. Um, so it's, you know, the, the um, free range production has grown into one of the most successful sectors of British agriculture and nearly half of all the British laying hens now have access to outdoors. So that's, that's brilliant. So a little bit of the background on the, um, the industry. So there are approximately 21 million hens in the colony cages in the UK. The commercial hens are sent to slaughter at approximately 72 weeks old, so about 18 months old. They're then considered to be past their peak laying production. Um, so the consumers very often are largely unaware of the, the hidden caged egg products in pro processed foods. So things like that we use every day, such as pasta, quiche, eggs, the mayonnaise, you know, we encourage people to look at the labels just to make sure that the, the eggs that are used in these products have actually come from free range hens. And the free range eggs now represent 67% of retail egg sales. So that's double what it was in 2004. So things are really, really going in the, in the right direction there. So each year we save of over 60,000 hens from slaughter. We have 44 pop-up rehoming or adoption sites nationwide. Um, we have a fantastic group of volunteers at each of the sites. They're very precious to us. The charity relies on their enthusiasm, their willingness to get up very early on the rehoming days to go and collect the, farm, the, the hens from the farms. They spend the day handing these hens over to the new um, the keepers, giving them advice and um, you know, on care, et cetera, for their new hens. And um, so we've got over a thousand volunteers and we really can't run the, the charity without them. They are very, very precious to us. Uh, there's uh, probably over 4,000 children now have learned about hens from um, and hen welfare through our education workshops. Um, and we also have a group of volunteers who carry out the workshops for clubs as well. So like the WI, um, et cetera. So what do we do beyond uh, the rehoming? So we try and promote positive campaigns aimed at improving the hen welfare. Um, our current campaign is Size Matters. OK, explaining why bigger eggs is not necessarily better, not for the farmers and not for the poor hens either. So it's things like, you know, with the modern day genetics, um, forced longer laying cycles, unnatural daylight, this can um, sort of make the hens lay sort of larger eggs. And the main issue for the hens is actually prolapsing. So, you know, hen welfare awareness is just taking care of those, those hens. So hens as therapy, um, we, we've seen the potential, the role that the hens can play in providing life-changing support, comfort to those who benefit most. Um, we all know that um, donkeys, there's the pack dogs, there's all sorts of different other species that are used um, for people who have um, maybe complex needs, et cetera. So we are now sort of thinking, well, Hens as therapy, yeah, we reckon that could be done. And various institutions such as the Rosemead Project are really interested in the work that we're hoping to roll out um, over the course of this year. Um, improving pet hen health. Now we know from the, the contact that we have with many of our rehomers, people who don't even rehome from us, but do, you know, our hen keepers as well. You know, there is a massive support for trying to improve the, the, the hen health. So key objectives for that is to improve the quality of the veterinary support for pet hens. So as I said that, you know, we're taking these hens, we're from the farms, we're rebranding them into pets. And we just would like the vets to see that the hens are, you know, see them as the pets and offer the same services, the medication and care of, you know, of the other pets that they would get. And currently we are working with the University of Nottingham to produce a massive open online course. 
So that is um, certainly well on its way and will av be available soon. So, um, so sorry. So um, in 2018, we started the build on a new um, homing welfare and education centre. So the centre was funded through various grants and donations um, from individuals, corporate sponsors, and um, and trusts as well. So there we go. There's a picture of it. So the centre houses. We've got two coops for holding hens on rehoming days. Uh, a drive-through adoption facility. This does lower the stress for the hens. And we jokingly say this is our version of a chicken takeaway, okay? Uh, within there, we have a fully fitted, fully functional hen hospital. And this is where we're going to be hoping to um, run some of our veterinary courses from. Uh, we've got rooms in there as well. We've got classroom in there. So this is going to enable us to offer um, sort of hen keeping courses, both there practically at the, the site, but also online as well. So um, that's, that's come along quite nicely. It's ready to go. We're just waiting for um, the COVID restrictions to ease and then we can, we can look at running our courses there. So what have we been doing? So 2020, um, Henry Homing were just sort of curtailed a little bit because we've had the lockdowns and, um, uh, you know, it, it did make rehoming for us very difficult for the rest of the year also into this year as well. Then back in November, we had the arrival of the avian flu. So this caused us even more disruption. Um, so uh, the, the housing order actually finished on the 31st of March, though the hens have been able to come out from their, their own lockdown. Um, so they'd been in lockdown themselves for three months. So hens can come out into the gardens now. So that's all been lifted. Um, and so that enabled us to commence our rehomings again last weekend, and we actually found pet homes for approximately 8,000 um, hens. So if we're looking at the environments that these hens are coming out from, so we're looking at the farms, so we've got the enriched colony cages there. So in 2012, the actual battery cages uh, were replaced with new cages, which each cage will house approximately about 80 hens. So um, the hens still have um, a small space inside their each, but they actually have more room to move around in amongst the others in there in the cage with them. And these cages now allow for some natural behavior. So they have some low perches that the hens can just sit up onto, an area for scratching, and also a nesting area with privacy curtains for laying their eggs. So a great improvement on what they had before, um, but obviously not ideal. Uh, barn hens, so these hens are in sort of loose house in large barns. There's usually several thousand hens in each barn, as you can see in the photograph that's there. Uh, they've got nest boxes, there's a good system of perching areas, and they are able to move around the barn, and they usually have some sort of litter on the, or bedding on the floor to scratch around in. These hens never come out from the barns, they are housed in there, but they're not caged. OK, so free range and free range organic hens. These hens have access, access to outside areas each day. We would hope that all the heads do actually make it out of the shed and um, go outside. Occasionally, if you get a, a bully hen that stands on the door, uh, some of the hens won't come out. So occasionally you will get these hens that have a, a little bit more like barn hens um, so they don't come outside. Now, free range organic hens. They're kept organically regarding the feed, um, the land, and also health care as well. So um, becoming a hen keeper. So if you want to adopt some hens, what makes a good hen keeper? Um, just a few things to consider here. So we, we you know, need the hens to have a safe and secure environment. Now, as a hen keeper, you are responsible for ensuring that your hens do not stray outside of your property. So it certainly needs to be safe and secure in that respect. Um, there's so many different types of housing um, that you can get these days. They range from wooden to plastic. You might convert a shed or a Wendy house. If you're purchasing a, a, a hen house or a hen coop, um, you know, the price varies immensely. 
Uh, you may prefer to build your own. And as I say, you might prefer to convert a shed or a, a, a Wendy house if the children have grown up. Um, no matter which you choose, uh, take into account your sort of local predators. OK, so we're looking at things like foxes, badgers, but there may be weasels around, mink. And then also think about attack from above as well. So your buzzards, your red kites, your birds of prey. And what we would say is if you're going to purchase a hen house, very often the manufacturers are quite generous with how many hens you can get into your house. So if you're looking at a house and it says, for instance, this house will house six hens, we would advise that you just go for maybe four hens, just to give them that extra little bit of space and comfort for them. Now, if we're looking at the space, but we don't want too much too soon, the ex caged hens are very naive when they come out from the cages. So they won't know how to shelter from the wind or the rain. And so we do advise that you keep them within their coop for the first week or so, just to ensure that they are homed. So before you're letting them out into the garden to free range, um, you know, and to, to um, forage around. This will get them also into the habit of knowing where to come back to um, go to bed at night, but also where they can lay their eggs. It's going to encourage them back into the nest box. They're used to laying in them. So you're not going to have to go searching around the garden, looking under all the, the bushes and shrubs to see where they've laid their eggs. So keep them in for a week to 10 days. Just get them homed to start with. Now, going to bed at night. So they might will need a little bit of guidance at first. So they're not going to know where to go to bed the first, first few evenings. And um, just guiding them in will be really helpful. If your hen house is raised off the ground, you may need to guide the hens up and down their ramp at first, okay? So coming out from the cages, they're just used to that flat mesh bottom of the cage. They're not used to going up and down. And just guiding them up and down will really help them and just ensuring that the first few days when you open the hen house to let them out, that they're not just taking a leap of faith from the, the top of the ramp and landing heavily on the ground and just injuring their legs. OK, so just do be a little bit of that and just be aware that initially they may sleep on the floor at first. They don't know how to use the perching. They're going to be much more comfortable just going to sleep on the floor. So a little bit of TLC, please, a little bit of understanding and certainly some patience, okay? The hens will soon be pecking around the new surroundings, but just be patient that if they don't come out of the house on the first morning, you know, it might be cold. They're, you know, they're gonna be peering out thinking, you know, what's this? This is a little bit different. And you may need to spend some time with your hens during the first few days, just ensure that they settle in and that they continue to eat. Um, really important that they just make sure that each hen is eating each day when they come out for their breakfast. So food and bedding. We do ask when the hens first come out from the farm is that you feed them with layers crumble when you first get them. This is the only type of food that they've been used to at the farm. So we, we would like the hens just to stay on that initially. If you would like to change them onto a pelleted food, just wait till they've settled in. You can check that they're all eating, gradually introduce the pellets to them and they will swap over. So a good, um, a good cozy layer of suitable bedding should be put on the floor of the hen house so that if they are sleeping there at night, they've got something there cozy to really keep them warm. So at Hen Central in Devon, we use the Denji Fresh Bed. We find that it's cozy, it's soft, it's soft for their feet, and actually it's quite easy to dispose of. We compost it um, ready for our new flower beds that are being put in at the moment at the... Um, at the new welfare centre. So really easy to dispose of as well. So understanding your new pet hens, okay? So just a few things to be aware of. So first of all, the pecking order. So this is a natural process which the hens will go through just sorting themselves out as to who's going to be the top bird and basically who isn't. So it can look a little bit rough at first, just be brave enough to stand back, let them get on with it. Um, if you think it's starting to look a little bit too rough, you can clap your hands, you can cause, um, cause a distraction. Um, 
be aware that it can take maybe two to three weeks for the hens to settle with each other. Um, they haven't come out with their best mates. Uh, they do get a little bit mixed up during the, the rehoming process. So they don't necessarily come out with the hens that were in the same cage with them. So, you know, it can take two to three weeks for them to settle down. Um, we do advise it if you've got one hen that's decided that she's going to guard the food and water, you may need to put some extra little food and water bowls around well out of her reach, um, just so that the others can eat and drink in sort of relative peace as well. Um, so uh, vaccinations and worming. So commercial hens have all been vaccinated for various poultry diseases, usually during their chick stage. Um, just like your cats and dogs, we do recommend that the hens are wormed three or four times a year. We recommend Flubin Vet, which is the only licensed hen worm on the market. And this you can purchase in either powder form or mixed into layers pellets. So we would recommend, as I say, three to four times a year for, for worming. Right, creepy crawlies, red mites, lice, external parasites. So again, just like dogs and cats, you do need to keep a close eye out for external parasites. So I think probably the most feared by um, hen keepers are the red mites. Tiny red mites, they live in the nooks and crannies of the hen house. They come out onto the hens at night to feed from them. So a heavy burden of mites can be quite detrimental to the health of your hens. And mm. you may even find that your hens will refuse to go to bed at night. So if all of a sudden the hens are refusing to go into the hen house, um, have a good look inside and see if there's something you can find in there in those nooks and crannies. OK, um, there are many products on the market to deal with these, but be aware that as well as treating the hens themselves, you will need to treat the hen house regularly as well. Um, so what are we looking at next? Treats. Wow. So what they want versus what they can have. So we all love to treat the hens and sort of pets as, as general. Um, if you're adding treats into their diet, we do suggest that you keep these to a minimum. Uh, they will upset the good nutrition that they're getting from their layers feed. So we would suggest um, an amount of no more than about 5% of their diet per day given to them in treats. Obesity in hens can lead to serious health problems. It can be um, lead to reduced egg production as well, heart problems, etc. Now, if you live in a vegan household, kitchen scraps are fine in moderation, but if you're not a vegan household, it is actually illegal to feed your hens kitchen scraps due to the cross-contamination of, of meat and disease. So the great British weather. So <laughs> here we go. Now, when rehoming uh, caged hens in the cold weather, um, it's really important to keep them warm. Keep them warm and keep them eating. That's the real main things. OK, so. Um, when you pop them, when you get them home, you're going to pop them into the hen house, leave them in there. The next morning when you open the door, if it's um, if they want to, they can come out. But if they're feeling cold, they may actually want to stay in there and just shelter from it. Um, during the winter, the hens will actually spend longer in the hen, in the hen house. So they'll be sheltering from the cold and the wet weather. OK, this might result in the um, house needing to be cleaned out more often, OK, because the hens will take mud and sort of wet feet onto the bedding. So that will need to be cleaned out a little bit more often during the winter. Obviously, in the summer months, we've got the long, sun, warm, sunny days. The hens are more likely to spend the, the warmer hours outside. So maybe in the summer, the, the hen house is not cleaned out quite as often. But please be aware of flies and fly strike as well. So keeping that hen house nice and clean and fresh. Um, laying behaviour and odd looking eggs. So the laying behaviour of the hens may change when they come out from the cages. So they've been in artificial heat and lighting. Uh, once they come out into the natural daylight, the laying cycle will change to a more natural cycle. And you'll find that some hens will go off lay for a little while while their bodies readjust to this and they will also lay less eggs during the winter months. But again, this is coming into that natural cycle, which is much better for those hens to, um, to do. So um, bare bottoms, and why is her comb floppy and pale? So very often the caged hens will have a rare 
sorry, a red bear bottom. So this is due to the heat in the cages and also the other hens pecking and picking at each other's feathers. And you do find that possibly the hens that come out from the, the uppermost cages are the ones that are slightly less feathered. And we do think that's possibly um, due to the heat that's rising from the, the, the lower cages. Um, the feathers do grow back. They might take two to three months to grow back. And very often this, this bare bottom does look quite big. Um, and it's generally, there's maybe a little bit of fluid in there, but once the hens are out and they're walking around, they're getting that lovely bit of exercise, that little bit of sunshine, the, the swelling, you know, the not the swelling, but the, the fluid does drain away and the feathers cover over and you'll never know that they ever had um, a caged bottom. So uh, when you pick the first, your first hens up, their comb might be quite sort of large and sort of floppy and pale. These act as heat dissipators in the warm cage systems. So once the hens, they come out of those systems, their natural daylight, that lovely bit of sunshine, they will slowly shrink, they become more upright, and then they'll become that vibrant red um, that we would expect to see from a, a um, laying hen. Now, meeting other family members. So the hens often show little fear of other pets, but we do suggest that you um, introduce them very gently in a supervised, controlled way. So maybe, um, you know, having your dog on a lead while you're bringing it up to the, the run where the hens are, just making sure that the dog doesn't jump towards the hens or bark at them. But you'll find that once the hens come out from the run and they're free ranging around your garden, that they might even have the dog and the cat within their own pecking order. So hens usually come out on top, but do just be a little bit careful when introducing the other pets to them. Any problems you have at all? So we are here for backup. So once you've got your hens, if you have any problems with them at all, we have the hen helpline and the phone number is there. Um, so the phone lines are open Mondays to Fridays, 10 till four. And we can talk through any of the problems that you, you, you've got, any issues at all with bullying, feeding, anything at all, do give us a ring. Or if you prefer, you can email us into the Hen Helpline um, at the email address that is there. So, um, you know, do contact us. We are here for backup. And even if your hens are not from us, if you've got um, the um, other sort of domestic breeds, you know, do contact us if you've got a problem because we're more than willing to help you. So let's just have a little bit of a look at the behavior of the hens. So we need to ensure that the hens are able to exhibit their normal natural behaviors. Um, otherwise they do become stressed and that will lead problems uh, within the flock. So foraging, one of the most important things that the hens need to be able to do. So if we look at the ancestors, so the wildfowl, they would forage for about 61% of their time during the day. So as a sort of natural creature, the hens are very busy creatures. Um, nesting and laying. So usually a hen will start looking for a nesting site about an hour or so before she lays the eggs. So that's why we provide a nice nest box in the, in the hen house, encourage the hens in there, encourage them to lay their eggs where it's easy for you to go and find them. They're nice and clean in a nice dry environment. So hens are very social when they are nesting, uh, which is often why they share one nest box. So you may have two or three nest box in next sorry, nest boxes in your, um, in your hen house, you'll find that they might just use one or two of those. That is absolutely fine. They are just very, um, you know, they, they are social nesting. They will use the same box. You'll find that the hens are almost queuing up to get in before one hen has even finished laying her eggs. So providing those nest boxes with lots of suitable bedding, making sure it's nice and cozy, they will settle down to lay quite well. Um, and also having that deep bedding in the nesting box will help eggs prevent um, or prevent the eggs getting um, squashed and broken. So keep that nice and clean in there. Perching. So the hens perch off the ground for security reasons. So they're able to sit up. If you have a look at these three, they're on the stable door having a look. They can see a long way away. They're looking for predators. Um, etc. So they do like to perch. Now, generally, 
they'll start to perch about 30 minutes before sunset. They'll go into the hen house, they'll start perching, or um, if they're in a barn, they'll go up somewhere high, they'll perch on there. They'll preen for a few minutes before settling down from the night. Uh, in the morning, they start stirring usually about 30 minutes before sunrise. Another short preening session before they're ready to face the day. Off they go out of the hen house, where's breakfast? Um, so as I say, some hens will prefer to roost in a nest box. Uh, this will offer them some security and comfort, especially if you've got one hen that's a bit of a bully in the hen house. You'll find that some hens will just prefer to go to sleep in the nest box. Absolutely fine. That's not a problem. Just ensure that you can clean the nest box out daily once the hens have come out before they start laying their eggs so that the eggs don't get covered in um, any droppings that have been done overnight by that hen. Uh, so moving on to preening. Um, several preening sessions during, during sort of the day, throughout the day. So this ensures that the feathers are kept aligned, they're kept in top condition. It also loosens any dirt, it loosens any parasites. Um, the, the preen gland, which is just in front of the tail, um, you don't normally see it unless you've got a, a hen that is quite poorly feathered. And it looks like a little nipple just in front of the tail feathers up on the back there. So that's um, going to prov provide the waterproofing oil needed and the hen will spread that through her feathers. So we often know about the ducks that do that, but the hens will do that as well just for their um, for the, the waterproofing. So moving on to dust bathing. So this helps to remove, it, it removes the dirt, the grease, external parasites. So, so the hens, when they start dust bathing, um, they will roll in the, the substrate, they'll scratch it up, they'll roll in it, disperse it throughout their feathers, stand up a good shape, that gets rid of the dirt. Some, hopefully some of the parasites will come out at the same time as well. Um, and you'll see that the hens, you can provide them with a really nice dust bath with some di diatomaceous earth in it, a little wood ash, a little bit of sand, keep it in a nice dry place for them. They will absolutely love that. And with the diatomaceous earth in that as well, that will help kill any of the parasites that the hens may have. So dust bathing, really, really important for the hens. Um, so if we look at sunbathing, there we go, three lovely hens, on those warm um, paving slabs. They really enjoy stretching out the sun. It's a real feel good factor. The heat of the sun, um, it warms and straightens the feather quilt, so straightens those feathers out. The birds, as you can see, they usually lie on one side, stretch a wing out, stretch their legs out, they have a bit of a doze at the same time. Just be aware if your hens are a little bit bare of feathers, you may need to apply some sun cream to their skin. Um, they do suffer from sunburn just like we do. So just be aware of that one. So here we go, signs of a sick hen. So um, just some signs here, things to look out for when you're first um, looking at your hens. So you might see that a hen is standing or sitting alone in a corner. Very often this might be the first sign that you see, um, you know, a hen is keeping herself to herself, keeping away from the others. Um, drooping and trembling wings sort of a hunched unusual posture, maybe with the tail down. This is a sign that the hen is in some discomfort and some distress as well. Um, appetite. Um, so we always say to people, please, when your hens come out in the morning, you're giving them their breakfast, make sure they're all coming out, they're all joining in, they're having something to eat, they're eating throughout the day. Um, occasionally this can get missed that one particular hen is not eating very much. And, you know, they will start to lose weight fairly quickly. Um, so uh, pale shriveled comb. So we know that the combs can tell us quite a lot regarding the health status of your hen. So we like to see a nice bright red plump comb that shows that she's in lay. Um, a comb that is small, dry, shriveled, a little bit flaky, that is really a sign of some ill health. So a little bit more of investigating, see what's wrong with the hen and just try and um, figure out what that might be. Now, messy feathers around the vent. So have we got signs of diarrhea? 
Is there a whitest discharge that's got quite an unpleasant smell to it? That could possibly be vent gleat. Possibly, as I said just now, it might be that you've got a hen that actually sleeps in the nest box. So she's actually sitting in, in the droppings overnight. So just deciding what those messy feathers around the vent can be from. OK, so um, you can trim the feathers. You can give a, a little bottom wash there. So just washing that off again, being careful of fly, uh, fly strike in the summer. Um, fly strike can happen so quickly you don't even know it. Um, before you, you know, before you realise you've got one very sick little hen there. So keeping that back end nice and clean is, is really good. So sneezing, wheezing, gasping, rattling, um, gurgling, runny noses, puffy eyes. OK, there are a few respiratory issues which can affect the hens. So you need to check for any um, discharge from the nostrils or the eyes. Is it clear and foamy or is the discharge thick and coloured? Um, you may need to check with your vet in case um, a course of antibiotics is needed. Um, another reason for a bit of uh, wheezing or gasping, gurgling, um, gape worm can cause this as well. OK, so gape worm is a worm that just hooks onto the, the um, trachea um, uh, with some hooks and a, a build up of these obviously blocks the trachea. So it's really important that you if, if it is a gape worm that you treat it. Flubin vet. As I mentioned earlier, the only licensed hemworm on the market will deal with, um, with the, the gape worm. But one thing you just need to know that although the flubin vet will kill the, the, the gape worm, sorry, um, the gape worm may not unhook, so it will kill it. So you, the hen may exhibit symptoms a little bit longer than you expect them to. So you're just waiting for that dead um, gape worm really to decompose a little bit and drop off and then the hen should be okay after that. Now, unusual um, droppings. So um, hens can produce a surprising variety of droppings, to be honest. And being sort of hen owners, we do sometimes get a little bit hung up on what comes out from the back end. So just get used to the difference between healthy and unhealthy poo. It's a very good way um, to monitor your flock's health. Now, lots of websites on, on um on the internet do have lots of lovely pictures of different types of poo so that you can compare your hen's poo to it. Um, normal droppings. So each hen will, will do about between about 12 and 16 droppings per day. Uh, usually there's a solid part, which is a brown gray color with a white cap to it. So the white cap is the urea part of the, the feces. Uh, hens will also past two cecal droppings each day. Now, this is a natural part of the, direct, the digestion, but it looks a little bit like, it might be like um, chocolate sauce or a bit of toffee or mustard sauce. It's gonna be sticky, it's smelly, it's really unpleasant, but actually it's a really good indication that the hen has got a healthy gut. So don't be worried if you see those around the garden. It's, it's actually quite a good sign. Now, just going back on those, um, just note that if your vet does prescribe antibiotics for your hen, we do advise that you give your hen some probiotics, and this will help counteract, counteract the imbalance of the gut flora, which results from the antibiotics sometimes. So just giving them a, a really good probiotic is going to be really helpful. Um, if you're giving your hens any medication at all, you may need to check for any egg withdrawal period. Um, really important. So do make sure that you're checking with your vet for that one. And with any products that you're using, whether it's medication, it's um, mite sprays or anything, please always follow the manufacturer's instructions. Um, you may need to wear a mask, you may need to wear um, some protective gloves as well. So always follow um, the manufacturer's instructions on the bottle or the, pack the packet. Now, a little bit about the boys, okay? So cockerels, they have several roles in the flock. Um, he's going to warn the hens about predators. He's going to protect the hens from them. He's gonna help them find some food. Um, he's going to stop some bullying amongst the hens. So he's gonna have a little bit of crowd control there. So that's, that's really, really good. Okay, um, he is gonna fertilize the eggs. Now we do suggest that 
um, having a cockerel in with only just a few hens, he is going to pester them quite a lot. Um, so it's better to have, you know, more hens per cockerel. So your ratio, you know, um, a lot of people say about eight or nine hens per cockerel is ideal, maybe even a few more. Um, so that way he's spreading his um, his attention across the flock rather than just on two or three. Now, um, fertilizing the eggs, there's been quite a, an issue over the last year with lots of people hatching out eggs over lockdown. Um, every day in the office, we're getting phone calls and emails from people who um, have got cockerels that they've hatched out that they now need to rehome. Um, we're not a, a, a poultry sanctuary. We don't rehome cockerels. Uh, we do offer a rehoming um, service. So we do have our Cockerel Lonely Heart scheme on um, our website. So do have a look at that. You can post the picture of the cockerel um, and hopefully somebody might take a fancy to him and will um, will sort of um, contact you about rehoming him. So, um, yeah, so a little bit there about the guys. We do care about them, but unfortunately we can't, we can't rehome them for you. So shop till you drop. So we do have the online shop. Um, we've got lots and lots of products that we're adding new products every month. Uh, we're doing special offers on them as well. There's chicken themed gifts. Uh, we do carry the Denji Fresh Bed for chickens because we, um, as I said before, we do use that one. And also we do stock the Allen and Page chicken feed as well. So just visit our shop um, on our website for um, all your all your goodies, really. And that's that's the end of my my presentation. So thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, okay. Fantastic, Alison. Thank you so much. That was absolutely um, fascinating. I know you were a little thank bit you. nervous with your first presentation, yes. <laughs> but it was brilliant. And we are getting a lot of questions in, some really Fabulous. fantastic questions. So we'll have some um, of those at the end and we can get to them. Thank but you. for, for now, um, just one question quickly, Alison. Quite a few people have asked if you can mention the name of that wormer. Um, again, so if you could just do that quickly. Yeah, okay. It's Fluben Vet. Flu Ben Vet. Okay. It's a licensed product. You can get it from your vet. Um, you do need to, um, if you're going to buy it from a, a store, they do need to have a specially qualified person on site to be able to sell it and, and give you advice on it. So, um, low, you know, your farm stores, somewhere like that, probably not available at your local um, high street pet shop. OK, but certainly from your vet, there's a, there's many websites um, on the Internet that you can you can purchase it from as well. So it's called Fluben Vet. It's the only licensed 10 wormer on the market. Lovely. Okay. Thank you, Alison. I just didn't right. forget that one because that was uh, important. Thank right. you. So um, without further ado now, I shall introduce um, Sarah while she's sharing her presentation. Um, so Sarah is from the, the smallholder range and growing up from a family of farmers in Lincolnshire, Sarah has always been interested in farming, horses and smallholding animals. Sarah studied animal science at Rittle College, focusing on farm animals and equines before joining smallholder range as a nutritionist in 2010. With many years of experience providing customers with nutritional advice for all their smallholder animals, Sarah has since moved into an area manager role, visiting customers and stockists around the east. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you for having us this evening. We're pleased to be involved. Um, so as Tracy said, I'm part of the smallholder range of the, um, just to tell you a little bit about who we are. We're a family run business, which has been a limited company since 1936. We provide premium quality feeds for smallholders who want to keep their animals as naturally as possible. We make feed especially for poultry and livestock who are kept in a free range or non-intensive condition. And all of the feeds you'll find in stores local to you are made here in our own mill on site in Norfolk. So why um, do we think you should choose the smallholder range over our competitors? So I'll start from the left-hand side and work my way around, just um, tell you briefly a little bit about our unique selling points. So it's really important to us to be non-GM. 
So we only have on site non-GM ingredients, which therefore makes non-genetically modified feeds. We go one step further than that. There are two classifications of being non-GM, something called hard identity preserved and soft identity preserved. To my knowledge, we're the only feed company that use hard identity preserved ingredients. Um, and that's something that's really important to us. Next is the veg being vegetarian society approved. That involves, again, uh, no animal byproducts uh, on site or in, in the mill at all. That includes using no gelatin coated vitamins. That does give the feed a slightly shorter shelf life of some of the feeds, um, approximately 100 days or three and a half months. But in our opinion, that's plenty of time to have the feed produced, sent to a local store and for you to feed the bag of um, the bag of feed. It keeps the feed nice and fresh and the turnover of feed as quick as we want it to. Next, you can see that, again, we have a completely drug free mill. So the wormer that Alison mentioned, um, again, that's something that we wouldn't have on site. So there's no possible risk of cross contamination between any of our products. Um, sometimes feeding waterfowl and poultry the same um, feed or products can cause issue. So we don't have any drugs on site at all. Equally in our feeds, um, our feeds are very, very natural. So we don't use anything artificial, any artificial yolk colorants, any artificial flavors or herbs. Anything that's used is human grade. So the way that we encourage a nice golden yolk color is to use ingredients such as marigold petals, maize and grass. There are no artificial yolk colorants in any of our feeds. Moving around to the um, oil logo there, we use linseed in our layers feeds. Uh, our eggs, uh, eggs from chickens who have been fed our feeds have had uh, high, particularly high levels of omega-3 when they've been tested. So that's something that's important to us. Um, it's really important to remember whatever you feed your chickens does ultimately end up in the eggs. So if you want to eat the eggs and um, give them away to friends and family, it's important to know what's going into those eggs. So normally if I'm doing a talk in person, I will ask if anybody has heard of hexane or hexane extracted ingredients. And very, very rarely has anybody heard of uh, hexane. So hexane is something that is derived from petrol or oil. And um, going back to the oil that we use, we use virgin pressed oil. So we use the first presses of oil, just like you would do in, in cooking with the olive oil. Once you get to the last parts of the oil from the seed or the bean, something called hexane can be used to extract those last uh, parts of the oil. Obviously the oil is poorer quality, but the company is still able to then say it in, is including for example, the linseed oil. That's something that we don't use. The top logo on the right-hand side is something that we're incredibly proud of. Um, that is the Royal Warrant, which uh, we gained in 2009. That is only awarded to companies that have supplied goods or services to royal households, demonstrating excellence and quality. Um, it in, also involves environmental concerns. So um, it's something that you do have to re-register to keep. keep. Um, so that's something that we're really pleased to, to have on board. So moving on to um, what I'll be touching on this evening. So feeding a good quality balanced feed um, should not be underestimated. It really is the um, most important thing about rehabilitating these chickens. I know some of you will own these chickens already and some of you are just researching, I'm sure, but it's really important um, to give them a really good solid entry back into the real world, if you like, after a commercial environment. Fresh water goes without saying. Um, these chickens are so highly bred to lay, they will give you a good amount of eggs. Eggs are 75% water, so it's important that that water is, is replenished. Grit is the only other thing really that's necessary aside a balanced feed and fresh water. This grit should be age appropriate, so a hen grit in this situation is ideal. Um, chickens don't have teeth, so they, um, they swallow the food whole or where they've just pecked it a little bit smaller. And it's the grit really which is stored in, um, in a part of the digestive system called the gizzard, which is a very muscular organ which contracts and expands. The grit is held there and that acts as the teeth partway through the digestive system. The only other thing which Alison mentioned as well, and I know is very popular with, with you um, hen keepers, is the amount of treats. And again, we'll touch on that a little bit later. 
So you can see here we have pictures of the two of our feeds that are recommended for ex-commercial or adult hens. So on the left hand side we have our natural free range layers crumble and on the right hand side we have the natural free range layers pellets. Chickens select their feed on the size and the texture. While they have some taste buds they don't work in the same way and they don't taste the same as we do. Um, in a commercial environment they will have been used to being fed a mash or a meal which is uh, even finer than the crumble on the left hand side. It's a very, very fine, has a dust like consistency. Because we want the chickens to not only get a, a really good quality balanced diet, but also um, recognize the food straight away, we advise starting with the crumble, as Alison mentioned, um, for a number of weeks until they settle in. If you would like to then move across to the pellets, uh, there's no, no nutritional difference between these two feeds. Um, it is just the texture of the feed that's different. But if you would like to ultimately end up on a pellet, we just suggest that over um, a week or two weeks, change the ratio uh, of the amount of crumble to pellet. So start with a couple of handfuls of pellets sprinkled on the top of the crumble. And once you're comfortable with the fact that they recognize it as being feed and they are all eating the pellets well, you can move over and change the ratio, give them more and more pellets every day until you're solely on the pellet. Um, again, that is totally personal preference. Um, some people prefer to feed a pellet, but nutritionally wise, uh, there's no difference between the two products. We suggest to give access to food all day. Um, it's important that chickens can eat as soon as they uh, wake up really, or as soon as they certainly are let out into the run from the coop. They don't need to be fed overnight. Um, they're too busy sleeping and snoozing um, during the night and that is when the feed is mainly digested. Um, both feeds are available in five and 20 kilogram bags, which you can see just in the right hand um, side on the bottom there, the, the pictures of the bags. Um, so if you only have a couple of hens or um, you haven't got much storage, then a five kilo bag may suit you. Otherwise, a 20 kilo bags are available in most stockists. It's important to remember here that, um, generally speaking, a higher quality feed, um, they will eat slightly less of. So chickens are governed, uh, or the amount of feed that they can eat is governed by the size of their crop, which is a storage vessel on the front of their neck. Um, once that crop is full, or thereabouts full, they, they don't really eat any more that day until the feed is digested overnight. Um, but generally speaking, a higher quality feed, they will eat slightly less of. Um, so this isn't a picture of our feeds, but it, it very clearly demonstrates the difference between the types of feeds on the market. And often we get questions on why we produce a crumble and not a mash. So you can see from the picture, a mash, as I mentioned earlier, is a lot finer, has a lot finer consistency, uh, quite dusty. So there are a number of reasons that we developed our mash into a crumble many years ago. Um, the first being selective feeding. So as I said before, the crumble and the pellet are exactly the same nutritionally wise. So we make a big batch of pellets up and grind uh, a proportion of those pellets down into the crumble, which is then bagged. The way that that differs from a mash, um, a mash, for example, if there's 10 ingredients into the, that are going into the layer speed, they are individually ground down for the mash and added to the bag Set as separate individual ingredients, along with vitamins and minerals. Uh, chickens are quite clever, and um, we don't quite know why, as, as I said, they don't really taste in the same way we do, but they are um, quite clever and they will selective feed. So for example, the maize, which is quite fatty, they may always try and pick the maize out, um, which means they will be not getting a balanced diet. With the crumble, each crumb is uniform, so they're not able to selective feed, so it gives them a much broader balanced diet. Um, with the mash again, as I said, all of the ingredients plus the vitamins and minerals are, are added into the bag separately. Because the mash is so fine, often what happened um, we were finding was the vitamins and minerals were heavier than the ingredients themselves, and unless you as the hen owner was mixing the bag of feed every day, the vitamins and minerals would often end up at the bottom of the bag, again, giving an opportunity for, for the chickens not having a balanced diet. 
In the, during the pelleting process, the ingredients are also micronized, which means steam cooked. So not only does that increase digestibility, which again means the chicken can get more nutrients out of the pellets than they would um, possibly from an unmicronized feed. It's also a safer way of providing the ingredients because they are cooked. Again, going back to the mash being quite fine and dust-like, um, we find that the crumble gives Gives, the, um, gives less opportunity to create mess. So it's um, less likely to blow away in the wind or be trodden around by the chickens as they're scratching around. So um, the crumble has been very popular since we launched that many years ago. And as I said, that's the one that we suggest starting them with and continue, continuing with, if you wish. Um, really that group provides all the benefits of a mash and a pellet combined. So I've mentioned how important um, our quality is to us. Um, so being GM free and remaining genetically modified free is really important to us. For that reason, um, a couple of years ago, we removed the soya from uh, layers feeds, both the crumble and the pellets. So they are now soya free for a couple of reasons. Um, unfortunately, genetically free um, soya is becoming more and more scarce. Recent estimates suggest that 75% of the global soya market is now made of GM soya. That's not something that we wanted to be forced into using um, for many reasons. So we removed the soya to remove that, that uh, any chance of um, having to, uh, uh, struggling to get source any ingredients um, and reducing the risk of contamination from any potential GM ingredients. Something important to us as well is an environmental factor, which I've mentioned before. So to reduce our carbon footprint, we used field beans as a replacement for soya beans, which not only helps support British farmers, but reduces food miles wherever possible. Also, we do always try and listen to our customers and um, we did have a fair amount of consumer demand um, asking if, if we could produce a soya free feed, which we did. So should we be feeding a balanced ration all year round? Um, chickens often will lay a little bit less or stop laying completely through winter. And that is all based on the, the amount of daylight hours. Also, um, chickens go through something called the molt, which is where they lose and regrow their feathers in a stage from, from their head all the way down to their tail. Um, ex ex commercial hens, our ex battery hens, um, don't always sort of stop laying that as I said they're so highly bred to lay and um, they often keep laying uh, equally at detriment to themselves so it is important that we, that we support them all year round whether they're laying or not laying um, it's important to remember that feathers are made up of 80 percent protein so if the protein is lacking in their diet they find it very hard to regrow the feathers um, and or lay at the same time so uh, keep feeding a balanced ration all year round. It ensures peak condition to resume laying in spring if they stop um, or equally may help them keep laying for longer through winter. And that's true of all chickens, not just um, ex-commercial chickens. So the big one, and Alison obviously gets a lot of calls about treats as well um, at the main uh, BHWT head office. Um, we know that you want to um, spoil your chickens, you know, they've had such a, a rough start to life and it's really important that they settle and, um, you know, treats can really help with the, the friendliness of them. But it's also equally important to remember that feeding a balanced ration, um, the majority of the time is, is best and most important. Um, one of the main reasons for that is every time you feed something that isn't balanced, you are reducing the amount of vitamins and minerals, um, including calcium that's fed. So to combat that issue, we uh, developed something called super mixed corn. To keep the calcium level high in the diet, we include um, a natural source of calcium in the form of limestone. So that's a really good way that you can still add something different, add a little bit of variety to your chicken's diet, but keep up that important calcium. We've also included flint grit. So I mentioned earlier, grit is um, a, um, an essential part of digestion for chickens. Um, and while there is some included in the supermix corn, we do always advise that you feed a separate, um, separate bowl of grit as well. So overall minimal treats should be fed. 
and um, Alison mentioned um, an amount of, a small amount of treats should be fed every day. Really, when we're talking about super mixed corn or similar, we would suggest no more than an egg cup full per bird per day, which works out about 20 grams. Any treats really should only be fed in the afternoon or evening, giving the chickens all the rest of the day, as soon as they wake up and through, through to the afternoon or early evening, a chance to fill up on the nutritionally balanced feed, which is really important to them. Also feeding in an afternoon or, or early evening as you're putting them away for the night um, can just enhance that bonding too. A small amount of greens is fine. And again, can add, uh, add a little bit of uh, variety to their diet. Um, some people hang greens up around the coop um, as a bit of an enrichment for them. But anything uh, citrus, rhubarb, tomatoes, raw potatoes should be fed. So we've had a partnership with the British Hen Welfare Trust since 2008. And that's something that we're really pleased with and really proud of. Um, we donate thousands of pounds to them every year just through the sales of our feed. So that is something that you can help with as well. So for every bag sold of the natural free range layers, crumble or pellets, we donate back to the British Hen Welfare Trust. So by feeding your chickens, the smallholder range feeds, not only are you giving them a fantastic uh, nutritional balanced diet, you're also giving back to the British Hen Welfare Trust, which I know you will all be really pleased with. So to conclude, I hope I've um, touched a little bit about how each feed is different. So do find out exactly what you're feeding. Um, everything should be listed on the white label of the bag of feed that you have there in front of you. Um, and equally, just because something says, for example, non-GM, it's important to go that one step further and find out if uh, the feed that you're looking at is um, completely non-GM and, as we are, hard identity preserved. I know it's boring, but um, do try and uh, minimise those imbalanced treats. Um, the picture below shows um, what they can, what the chickens can come out of the commercial life looking like, and we want them to thrive and rehabilitate and become as healthy as possible. So diet plays a, a huge part in that. If in doubt, we have um, a really good team of nutritionists here on site who are all clued up on all things chickens. Um, we have a helpline number there, um, which you can come through to any weekday from 8.30 until 5 o'clock and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions for you. So I'll hand back to Tracy, thank you. Thank you so much. That Again, that was absolutely um, fantastic, Sarah. Um, really interesting. If I could just ask you to stop sharing your screen and then I shall start sharing mine. Again, we have got some more wonderful questions um, coming in and I'm really looking forward to, to getting to those um, to the end. So just while I'm um, multitasking and trying to uh, share uh, my own screen as well. Um, my name, as I say, is Tracy. I've been with Denji as actually an equine nutritionist for about 15 um, years or so now. Um, and you might therefore wonder, well, what am I doing um, actually talking in a chicken webinar? Um, I do kind of love chickens and I would actually love some myself. I've even got some names for them all lined up when I'm able to get some. Um, but at the moment, unfortunately, I live somewhere where I'm not allowed them. So at the minute, I don't actually have any. Um, I have a degree in animal science and behaviour and a master's in equine science as well. And I've been lucky enough, obviously not over the last year or so, but prior to that, to do some of the kind of trade events um, and things like Country File Live, for example, with the British Hen Welfare Trust um, as well. So I've picked up lots of tips and information um, during that time. So in the last of this evening's um, presentations, I'm going to be talking about Denji Fresh Bed for Chickens, which is our kind of bedding offering for the ex-commercial um, hen um, in particular, but it is also suitable for all poultry and other birds um, such as duck, for example, geese um, and even quail as, as well. So don't just be um, confined to the chicken. The only animals that we don't really suggest it for are the kind of small furries that are kept in small confined um, cages. So just to um, kind of give you an overview, I shall just turn off my video so you can see a bit more. 
Um, you may not know who Denji actually are, especially if you're not into to horses as well. We are actually the largest um, grower of alfalfa in the UK and have been growing alfalfa for over 50 years now. Um, you may actually find um, alfalfa included in some of the kind of chicken blocks that you can find on the market as well. Denji actually started life as a farmers cooperative and many of the original members are now stakeholders providing a wealth of experience. We grow over 5,000 acres of alfalfa in Essex, plus 1,000 acres of alfalfa in Lincolnshire um, as well. In 2019, the British Equestrian Trade Association National Equestrian Survey found that Denji was the most popular brand of horse feed in the UK, maintaining our position from 2015. We are also exceptionally proud to have held the Royal Warrant since 2007 as a mark of quality and ser um, service, supplying the Royal Studs at Sandringham and Balmoral. So Denji are all about a sustainable future. Our top three ingredients are 100% sourced from the UK and our top five ingredients that go into our products account for 97% of all the raw materials that we use. Only molasses, which goes into our horse feeds, comes from outside of the UK. At our Lincolnshire site, they've got over 40 years of data and on the cereal estate have only um, had a rise in their cereal yields when alfalfa is part of the crop rotation. So alfalfa is proving to be a truly great break crop for them and improving the yield of the cereals that they have. Um, one of the Denji growers uh, was Soil Farmer of the Year in 2018, and this is a national recognition for the work being done to protect and enhance soils as well. So how does that link us um, to the British Hem Welfare Trust and chicken bedding? Well, we've been working with the British Hem Welfare Trust for 10 years um, now, so um, quite a considerable amount of time. And back in 2011, uh, the British Hem Welfare Trust actually set us a challenge. They asked us to produce a cosy bedding for ex-commercial hens who often want to nestle down into the bedding rather than roost. And by the way, if it deters red mites, then even better. And the feedback, particularly from the British Hen Welfare Trust, um, was that materials like shavings, um, they felt they were quite abrasive and not very warm for hens who often lacked full feather, um, full feather coverage. So that was the challenge um, set to Denji, and it's one that I'm pleased to say um, that we took up. Um, and following product development and testing of Denji Fresh Bed for Chickens was hatched, um, no pun intended. Um, product testing was not only carried out by some discerning hens from the British Hen Welfare Trust, but many chickens owned by friends and family of the Denji team. Um, I even actually tried some in my horse's bed. The only trouble was she was actually really attracted by the smell of it and tried to dig it up and eat it. So that ended that experiment for her. But the result of all of this was Denji Fresh fresh bed for chickens, which contains dust extracted wheat straw with a light addition of pine oil for a fresh, warm and cosy bed for your chickens. And our sustainability message, you know, continues not only from our horse feed, but into our bedding as well. And two of the key things that we, we wanted to do in association with the British Hen Welfare Trust was to produce a bedding um, that had sustainability and biodegradability in mind as well. And these are important requirements for the components of fresh bed. So as I say, fresh bed is made up of two things. It's made up of the wheat straw and the pine oil. And 10 years ago, materials like this were considered as byproduct or not very valuable. But thankfully, their kind of value has um, been seen and they're now recognised more as important co-products and the valuable resources they are. So as I'm sure you're aware, um, wheat straw is grown for both human and animal consumption. And straw is a co-product. So it's a valuable product that comes out of another valuable product and that's the basis for the the Denji fresh bed. When it comes to the pine oil, pine trees are grown for timber to make furniture. Byproducts such as bark goes to make paper and the paper makers don't really want that paper to smell of pine so that is extracted and it's the pine oil that then is added to Denji um, fresh bed. So it's a great feature of fresh bed that both ingredients are co-products. So we're making use of materials that would have otherwise previously been wasted. But not only that, their natural origins mean that they decompose effect, um, efficiently and safely and therefore fit in with the, the Denji ethos. 
Um, from the point of view of you as hen owners, um, as has already been mentioned by Alison, you know, we, we want to be able to dispose of the chickens bedding and dropping really easily. And that can certainly be done um, on the compost heap as well. With um, regards to the Denji fresh bed, it would be kind of um, classified, if you like, as a valuable source of carbon or browns, if any of you are into your composting. Um, a good compost relies on a kind of a good mix of about 50-50 greens and browns, so things that are greens are things like your lawn mowing clippings, for example, and then your browns are more of your woody stemmy material and like straw. So get a good mixture of those and you can get a good compost going on. As an avid vegetable gardener and a family slightly obsessed with compost, I'm always up for taking samples of fresh bed that we've taken for quality testing home to go on the compost heap. So although I don't have chickens, some of the dengue fresh bed does make it way, its way to my compost and onto my um, vegetable patch in the end. Um, as well. If you'd like to know a little bit more about um, the Denji origins, um, we do actually have a page on our website all about sustainability and the product origins as well. Now, whilst I have been talking lots about sustainability, it won't have escaped any of you that are using Denji Fresh Bed that we are still at the moment using um, plastic packaging. Obviously, the most important thing here is the way in which we dispose of that packaging. And if you have a look on the Denji packaging, you will see that it's an LDPE and carries a recycling symbol number four. So this means that should kind of curbside collections exist in your area, then your council should take it away or you can take it to your local recycling um, centre. But it is probably worth checking with your actual council to know whether they do dispose of that or not at your curbside. So we do use um, plastic for a specific reason, and that's really in terms of maintaining the product quality because it has to be transported from A to B and to get to you as well. And straw is very springy and we need to use a huge amount of pressure to contain it kind of long enough to pack it. So from that perspective, perspective plastic does have its positives if we have a packaging failure at the point of sale then unfortunately that would be the most unenvironmentally friendly scenario for us because we've got all the cost of making it and delivering it without the benefit of you then actually using the product so that's something that we want to avoid and that's partly whilst we are still using plastic. Having said that, we are reducing our use of plastic and cont um, continuously considering alternatives to plastic as well. And we are introducing plastic that contains 30% recycled um, material already. So you will see this sign on the right here, this maximum recycled content appearing on your bag soon. And we are looking to increase that to 50% when supplies allow. Other things that we're doing is we're sourcing carbon neutral paper for product guides and information leaflets or reducing the use of leaflets full stop and going digital kind of where we can. Um, we're linking kind of with Cool Earth, supporting farmers around the world. So look out for logos appearing on packs soon as well. You'll also see that we support um, organisations like the Essex Wildlife Trust as well. But back to kind of dengue fresh bed um, for your chickens. Um, you can use fresh bed as a cozy substrate on the coop floor to collect drop-ins and urine and set up a cozy deep bed in the nest boxes to keep the hens warm and the eggs protected. We have kind of numerous pieces of uh, feedback from happy customers of dengue fresh bed and they do say that it tends to keep the um, eggs nice and clean. So with five hens, we, um, a 50 litre bale will last approximately two weeks, whilst a 100 litre bale will last approximately four weeks. So we have two different sizes of Denji fresh bed available. So a nice big value for money pack and a slightly smaller pack, which is easier for you to store at home. When you've used your Denji fresh bed, we would suggest keeping it somewhere kind of um, in the dry. So something in the bin or resealing the bag and keeping it in a, a shed, for example. With using Denji Fresh Bed for chickens, what we want to do is to clean the droppings and the wet patches daily and then have a weekly or fortnightly thorough clean of the um, kind of bed according to how kind of dirty your hens, individual hens are. So keep the, the coop nice and clean. So that was just my quick kind of presentation on the Denji Fresh Bed um, for chicken. I will stop sharing my screen now because we have reached the time 
that we can finally answer some of these questions that have come in. So if Alison and Sarah, if you could unmute and pop your um, cameras back on again, I will start uh, finding us some questions because there's quite a lot. And as I say, for any of you that have put them in the Q&A boxes, if we don't get them back to you to tonight, um, then we will endeavour to drop you an email at some stage uh, with the answers as well. Um, so actually, um, Alison, I'm going to start with you because we have quite a few questions ahead of time um, this evening. Um, and unfortunately, there was quite a common theme when it came to um, feather pecking or hens bullying each other. Um, so there was quite a lot of um, questions in relation to, to that. Um, so some people want to know how's best to prevent it. And secondly, um, if they have separated a hen because of feather pecking that's being kind of bullied, how do they then safely reintroduce that back again with the other hens? Okay, so we've probably had a, um, a problem with a lot of hens over the last three months because of the housing order that they've been under from DEFRA because of the avian influenza. So I think there has been quite a problem with a lot of hens that have been sort of pecking each other's feathers out, things like that, you know, um, just sort of some behavioural problems because of that. So hopefully for a lot of people, now the hens are coming out that will um, ease because the hens will be busy doing other things. Um, ways to prevent it is um, lots of enrichment for the hens. So hanging things up, at, hen, at head height. So things like um, seed, shiny CDs, um, some vegetables, um, a, a good handful of weeds from your garden, hanging those up as well. Um, just anything that will take the focus off the other hens, okay, and the pecking. Um, I would always suggest having a, a spray can of the violet or the blue wound spray. So that if a hen has got a particularly sore place where she's been pecked, um, cover that up with the blue or the violet spray. It takes the focus off that red raw sore bit that the other hens are going to go for. So always have one of those in the in the first aid box. Have that one ready. Um, so uh, trying to get a hen back in with the others. Um, hens are very territorial and when you take one out it's very difficult to get that one back in again because she can be seen as a stranger they don't want her back in so that can actually prove quite difficult for a lot of people to get that that hen back in again so again it's lots of enrichment it's lots of other things going on um, hanging things up at head height um, if you've got enough room to put something like a straw bale in that they can peck at, they can sort of perch up on it, they can do all sorts of things with that, scattering a little bit of the, you know, the mixed corn um, under a pile of leaves, so they've got to search around for it. So it's trying to give the hens lots of other things to do that take the focus off the one that you're putting back in. Um, but it, it can prove quite difficult. And, you know, we absolutely love our hens, we love them to bits, but sometimes they can be Blimmin' nasty to each other. And you just think, well, you know, why? So that can be a difficult one, but um, any problems like that, people can always give us a ring on the advice line and we can have a chat through their individual um, issues that they've got with their particular hens. And sometimes it's easier to talk to an individual person so that we can see what setup they've got, what we can suggest for them, how it might work, try this, you know, do this a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, always give us a ring on the advice line and we'll we can try and help with that one. Yeah, excellent. That's great. I was quite um, fascinated to learn at one stage about chicken spectacles for for that purpose as, as well, um, at one of the yeah. Uh, Okay, so another question, what's the average life expectancy of a rehomed hen? I think that's quite a, a nice one. Yeah, okay, it's a really difficult one to say because we can't guarantee how long this hen is gonna live. You know, it's, um, I mean, we like to think probably three to five years. So they come out at about 18 months old. Um, occasionally you may get a hen that finds the, the actual rehoming day quite daunting. So they do need that extra bit of TLC when you get them. They're not the sort of creatures that you can just stick out in the back garden and forget about them for a week. They really do need a bit of hands-on, ensuring that they keep eating, making sure that, you know, they're warm enough, as I said earlier. Um, so, you know, three to five years, that's, that's really lovely. That's really, that's really good. But, you know, occasionally we talk to our rehomers on the phone. Um, I was talking to a lady about six months ago, 
um, she'd lo just lost one hen that she'd had for nine years from us. Wow. Wow. So it's it's like with any animal, it really depends on the, the actual health status of that individual. Um, and we always advocate feeding a really good, high quality um, food um, as well. So, you know, get them out in the sunshine, give them that lovely life. If they if they last for, you know, a few years with you, what we like people to think about is that lovely life that they've had since they've come out from those cages and they're enjoying that five star um, retirement home yeah. so you know it's yeah. it's a it's a difficult one to say to put a finger on it but um, maybe three to five years is, is quite good. Thank you and um, Sarah I think this might be one for you um, one um, lady would like to know um, whether hens should have access to any food water overnight or can they manage until the the morning? They can manage until the morning um, yes so as soon as they come out from the hen house into the coop, uh, make sure they've got access to food and water. But as soon as you pop them away for the evening, um, no, it's not necessary. OK, lovely. Um, there was another question I saw a bit later on in relation to um, treats or kind of um, boredom breakers, if you like. Um, you mentioned about kind of giving them midday and an evening. One lady said that she couldn't do it midday because she works is it fine to leave it till the evening and not give it till then or oh yes definitely yes I mean it's just more of a fact of not giving it to them first thing because you will find that they prefer that so it's really important that they have lots of time to have access to the crumble or the layers pellets um, and then give them the treats if you wish to later but no there's certainly uh, no no set time to feed Okay, perfect. And I think this next question might be for both of you. But Sarah, if I start with you, um, somebody says almost um, most of our girls when they get older have issues relating to egg laying. Is there any way to stop them laying or should we be changing their diet um, as they get older so they can enjoy um, retirement with minimal problems? Or is there anything the vet can give to stop them producing kind of eggs? So a, a diet question first, and then we'll go back to Alison on the, the vet bit probably. Um, <laughs> From, from the diet perspective, we recommend really continuing to feed the layers pellets. Um, there's nothing in the layers pellets to, to force them to lay. It's just to support their natural laying cycle. Um, if you rehome the hens at the same time, they will still uh, naturally end laying um, at different times possibly. Um, but no, we, we really generally recommend a layers pellet all the way through. Okay. Alison, do you have anything to add to that question? Um, yeah, the, um, if, if people want to take their, their hens off lay, if they've got a problem, if they've got a laying problem, so maybe something like egg yolk peritonitis, um, something like that, then the vet can actually um, put an implant into the hens, um, sort of like a hormonal implant, which will take them off lay for about, usually between about three and, and nine months. And that does depend on what time of the year that they give that to them. Uh, that can just sort of give the hens a bit of a rest if they've had a problem, if they had a prolapse, as I say, if they've had a yolk peritonitis. Um, also, they, there was an injection that I believe that they can have as well, uh, which is called Devesteron. Um, and that would be an injection which is about every 12 weeks for them to do that, so... Okay, thank you. Um, just there's quite a lot of questions. It looks like, um, unfortunately, chicken lockdown has caused lots of problems for, yes. for everyone by the by the looks of it. Um, quite a, a few questions that look like um, relating to kind of nighttime routine, if you like. So somebody's got a um, cockerel and a favourite hen that have got used to roosting in the stable rather than their safe plastic coop. And I saw another question, a similar kind of question, where the hens got used to being in the shed rather than their normal coop and now they're not going back to their normal safe um, places is there any way we can get them back to where they they need to be should we be doing that or can we leave them as they are kind of safely overnight in a stable okay um as i said earlier you know sometimes if they have um if there's a really bad infestation of red mites um in the hen house that can prevent the the hens and you know, maybe the cockerel going back in at night um very often that's the, the first thing that we say to people is check your house make sure that there's no red mite in there um because the hens they it's very irritable for the hens overnight and it is detrimental to their health now, if they're deciding that they want to um, sleep elsewhere because it's quite nice, it's the summer months, it's, you know, it's quite nice outside, camp out, outside, as it were, it can be difficult to get them back in again. It's, it's trying to get them um, 
into maybe the the hen run before they start settling up in you know I've known um, hens that like to go up into a tree to to roost so it's just catching them before that time when they start to about half an hour before sunset they start they start to think about right where are we going to bed let's let's get sorted um, so catching them before that time, getting them into the hen run, getting them into the hen house and just trying to establish that sort of a routine with them. It can be difficult, but it can be done. OK, excellent. Um, I've got to fit this question in because it, I just love it. Um, so somebody's daughter is obsessed that chickens see worms as blue. Um, so they, they want to know um, is when we dig up earthworms for the, the hens, are they seeing them in the colour blue? <laughs> um i that can't means... answer that one i'm really sorry I have absolutely no like idea <laughs> i'll have to research it <laughs> that's fine um is the uh, gizzard the same as the croup um and does um looking at those tell us anything about how much the hen is eating um and, and things like that <clears throat> OK, so, yeah, so the crop is on the front of the hen's chest, basically. So that's her shopping bag. So during the day when she is out foraging around, she's filling that up. OK, so when they go to bed at night, the crop should be full with food. And as she sleeps, that will pass through into the gizzard, which is the next part of the digestion. So as Sarah was saying, that's the bit where there's all the, the grit and that's, um, that replaces the hen's teeth, if you like. So the food passes through as the hen sleeps, it goes into the gizzard, that grinds it all down, and then it passes on through to the rest of the digestion. Um, so in theory, in the morning, when the hen gets up, that crop is empty, ready to start her shopping trip all over again. Oh, so, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I've got a couple of Sarah questions now. So um, firstly, Sarah, is cr a crumble feed more suitable than pellets for smaller bantam breeds, for example? Um, our pellets are some of the smallest on the market anyway. Um, so they're two and a half mil in diameter. And we do make sure that they're cut very short. Um, to enable them to be su suitable for bantams. Um, so it's personal preference again, um, doesn't really matter, but the pellets are nice and small, so they are suitable for smaller breeds. Good to know, excellent. Um, and somebody else has said, said that they've seen loads of products that are additives to the feeds. Is there any reason to add anything else to the smallholder feed if you're using it as recommended? Um, no, not really. No, not unless you have a specific problem. So there are prebiotics included in the feeds already, um, a full complement of vitamins and minerals. Um, so there's not really anything that you would need to add from a health perspective unless you have a specific problem. Yeah, OK. Um, I think this one is um, an Allison one and, and a really useful one for anybody that's perhaps a new hen keeper. Um, you spoke about hens showing signs of being poorly. What are the most common things to look out for, Alison, in terms of illnesses that they they might have and how ill is is ill? What's you know, what's enough to take them to the vet and when is TLC at home best? OK, so um, really, when you're looking at the hens, it's. Um, it can be difficult to start with because they are a prey animal. So they do tend to try and hide any illness or um, lameness or anything to start with. So sometimes it's not very obvious to start with. So it's looking for those signs. The signs that we went through just now um, is the hen just taking herself to one side a little bit on her own, um, you know, uh, sort of drooping wings, head hung down, that comb. The comb is a really good indicator of what's going on. Um, so things like that. Um, the most common things, I think, when people first rehome, the, the, especially the ex-caged hens, is that sometimes they do come out from the, the cages a little bit underweight. They are not ill as such, and we never knowingly rehome any sick hens. Um, but sometimes that, that rehoming day is really quite daunting. It's quite stressful for them, and that can really just have a little bit of a knock-on effect for some of the hens for those first few days. So that extra bit of TLC, making sure they're eating, um, if they're on the crumble, what, what we say to people, if you've got a cold hen, she's not eating very well. If you mix a little bit of a hot water with that crumble, um, you know, it makes a nice warming meal for them. So it warms them kind of from inside out, if you like. So really the most important thing is keeping those hens to eating. And that crumble, it's, it's a good high quality one. 
Um, and yeah, just add some hot water, make it sort of damp, not runny. So it's not a runny porridge, make it damp and you know offer it to the hen if it's warm they get that aroma off it so it just encourages them to eat a little bit more um another good thing to do another good trick to get them to eat is um i actually happen to have one here sorry so have a little glass dish okay put the crumble into it add a little bit of the warm water and if you get a teaspoon and you hold this up to the hen and you just tap into the bottom of the dish, the hens do copy, um, you know, they're very good at copying what's going on. So the fact that you are tapping something, it sounds like there's another hen eating that food, but also that up and down movement with a teaspoon, um, they, they think there's another hen eating. So that really does encourage them to eat. So for me, um, that's probably the, the main thing that people just need to be aware of is when they, they first rehome these hens. If it's cold, it's, it's miserable outside, they're going to get cold. So that nice bit of deep bedding on the floor of the hen house, make that really cozy and keep them warm, keep them eating. That is really the most important things. That's a fantastic tip. Thank you, Alison. Um, there was quite a lot of interest in worming and a few questions saying kind of how soon after rescuing should you be worming? OK, so we would recommend that with your with the caged hens, OK, because they're in that cage, they're standing on a, a mesh floor, the droppings are falling through. So they tend to come out from the farms with not really much of a worm burden at all. So for them, we would say probably six to eight weeks. Think about worming them then, okay? With the barn hens and also the free range hens, because they are all stomping around in each other's poo and picking up all sorts of things, we would recommend that let them settle in for maybe two weeks and then get them wormed as well. And then if you've already got hens, bring them in line with, with what you currently do. And as I say, with the Flubin vet, uh, we recommend sort of three to four times a year. Okay, lovely. Um, a couple of questions on um, uh, feathers. Do we need to clip the flight feathers? Not necessary. Not unless you've got a hen that is taking flight. Um, generally, what hens will do is that um, if they're walking around the perimeter, if they're looking for a way out, there's either going to be a little hole in the hedge somewhere or in the fence, they're going to squeeze through that. Um, or they, they'll use something as a springboard. So if you've got a compost heap or a dustbin or something that they can pop up onto and then pop over the fence, that's probably more likely what they're going to do. If you need to wing clip, you're only going to clip one wing and you're only just going to do again across the flight feathers. Um, anybody again needing any advice on that, just give us a shout and we can just describe that better. So a good sharp pair of scissors, somebody to hold the hen just to hold the wing out to extend it and then just um you're going to just snip across those flight feathers okay it's quite easy to do you just got to be a bit brave that's all <laughs> fair enough um there's a couple of questions um regarding fly strike in terms of people perhaps not quite certain what it is or how to spot it in the first okay. instance yeah okay so fly strike so during the summer months when it's warmer um if the um, if the hen has got a wound, if there's a wound or, um, you know, some poo stuck to the back end, it's going to attract the flies to it. The flies are going to lay their eggs, okay, and when the eggs hatch out, they'll actually start eating the flesh of the hen. So the, the maggots will start eating in, into the flesh of the hen. Um, or, I mean, any animal it can happen to, absolutely, you know. And literally within 24 hours, you know, if it's not noted, um, you know, you need to get rid of all the maggots, um, she'll need some antibiotics. So usually um, a, a, a good chat with the vet, um, you know, is a really, really good idea. OK, but it can happen really quickly. Um, so in the summer months, I would say to some anybody, if they've got a hen that is suddenly just whoa, she's gone right downhill, she's on her own, she's really droopy, she's mopey, she's lethargic, pick her up and have a really good look at her. OK. Absolutely. No, that's great. Um, Sarah, somebody um, was a, kind of a new kind of hen keeper um, and they're just unsure how um, how much or how to distribute grit for four hens. Any advice, please? <laughs> yeah, really simple. Just um, you can buy hen size grit at any um, country store or feed merchant and you just 
fill a bowl up and leave it there and they'll pick what they need to. Um, really easy. It, the more free ranging uh, or free range area they have access to, they'll be picking up little stones anyway, um, but it's always good just to have um, access to, to a flint grit all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and there was some questions kind of relating to that with people perhaps not fully understanding grit. Do you put grit and feed together or just grit alone? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, just in a separate, in a separate, um, bowl is absolutely fine yeah feed you really want to keep nice and clean so um top up but also um make sure that it's not sitting around for, for weeks on end um but the grit you know as long as it's fine and dropping free can stay in a separate separate bowl for, for yeah. a number of weeks okay um and the the next question i'm going to make the last one because we have run over because there's been so many good questions but fear not those that are in the q a we will um, email people um but there was just a question about clipping toenails so one for you alison i think um somebody said our first lot of hens have clipped nails already but our sec second lot have very long um nails um so what do they do about that <laughs> Okay, really easy, absolutely really easy. You just need some of the, the sort of toenail clippers that you would buy for a, a dog, um, but a good size pair, not the little tiny ones. You want a good substantial size of those. Um, just get somebody to hold the hen um, safely under their arm for you. Take hold of the foot. You're just going to trim the, the um, toenails back. You just need to be really careful because they do have the quick, which has got the nerve endings and the blood supply as well. So if you go back too far, they are going to bleed and that is actually quite painful. So um, if you're not very brave, just nibble back a little tiny bit at a time. But sometimes when the hens come out from the cages, um, because again, they're standing on that mesh floor, the toenails just grow round and they, they're quite curled when they come out sometimes. So um, our volunteers at the sites are really good. They'll, you know, if they pick a hen up to put it into somebody's box or their carrier and they notice that those toenails are quite long, they will just snip them for them. But it's a really easy thing to do yourself. I'm sure there's loads of um, information on, on YouTube that you could have a look at. We've got information on the website as well. Um, but just if you're not that brave, just nibble it back. Um, you don't have to take them back too short because once you've shortened them off and you've got that curve off the, the nail, while they're out foraging, they're scratching around, they are gonna just keep them sort of down as well. So air a little bit on the side of caution, don't cause the hen any sort of pain by going too short. Uh, you can get something called Trimex, which is like a powder, which if you do cause it to bleed, you just dip it in there and it just stops the bleeding. Um, so always a good idea to have something like that handy. Um, but yeah, just you know, be brave enough and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. Well, um, thank you uh, very much for that, both Alison and Sarah. It's been a fantastic evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I can't wait to get my own hens to put some of this into uh, practice at some stage. Um, everybody, don't forget, obviously, um, Alison mentioned the British Hen Welfare Trust kind of helpline. Do use that um, and we will certainly endeavour to get back to you with some of these questions as well. But other than that, for now, I think we need to head away to our beds. So I shall say good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks. Bye. Bye.